joining the platform. We are recording. So thank you everyone so much uh, for joining us for this important discussion today. Uh, I especially wanna thank my staff, uh, Andrew Dunn, Al Bannon, and everyone else on the team for helping us uh, organize this event. Uh, I'm gonna be giving a brief uh, update about my work in Congress, uh, but I'm really eager to hear from you. This is a discussion uh, and it's gonna be a two-way conversation. So the Biden-Harris administration is preparing for an upcoming conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. Uh, that demonstrates a, a deep commitment to finding solutions to end hunger, to improve access to nutritious food, and to strengthen our nation's food system. The first uh, White House conference on food, nutrition, and health was more than 50 years ago, so it's about time for another. Uh, it resulted in an expansion of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, and the National School Lunch Program. It also established the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, which we know as WIC. Uh, and it that critical work that was done 50 years ago paved the way to significant reductions in food insecurity for millions of individuals and families. Now today, with the pandemic, with increasing income inequality, there's an urgent need, but also an opportunity to develop solutions to end hunger. No one, regardless of their income, zip code, citizenship status, who they are, who they love, no one should wonder where their next meal is coming from. There should not be barriers to accessing food in the United States. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the crisis and highlighted the urgency of addressing the gaps and vulnerabilities in our country's food uh, security and nutrition programs. According to a report by Oregon State University, hunger in Oregon surged about 10% to more than 24% of Oregonians. That was in October of 2020. Fortunately, childhood food insecurity fell nationally because of our work in Congress to expand child nutrition programs and enhance SNAP benefits for adults and families. Although there was not um, a major fluctuation in 2021 of food insecurity, we know it is again on the rise. And we also know that these numbers are higher for BIPOC Oregonians who experience widened disparities. The pandemic has taught us a great deal about the unmet needs in this country, and we must do more to protect and to support our most vulnerable populations. As chair of the Education Committee's Civil Rights and Human Services Subcommittee, I've been focused on making sure that all students can access nutritious meals. We're working on reauthorizing, updating our child nutrition programs, which is a top priority of mine as a subcommittee chair, but also we know long overdue. Recently, I had the opportunity to visit with Chapman Elementary School students in Portland during their lunch hour and have to serve meals. And it was really, really powerful to hear from this very enthusiastic group of third graders about why it's important for every student to have access to healthy meals. If you want hope for the future, talk to some third graders. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, Congress came together to extend the child nutrition waivers that were established at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, that was based on bipartisan legislation that I led uh, that to, to make sure that children are not going hungry. Um, I also worked on a bipartisan update to the Older Americans Act that was signed into law in 2020. I just want to note that <clears throat> that, that bill was called the Keep Kids Fed Act, the one that, that recently passed and what a difference it's making. So with the Older Americans Act, which I've been working on for, for several years, it helps seniors, it truly helps seniors age with dignity. It includes nutrition services that cover the cost of meals for our most vulnerable seniors, including a public private partnerships um, with organizations like Meals on Wheels. Oh, he's doing a great job out there. So in 2018, nearly 150 million meals were delivered by this program. And during negotiations on the Build Back Better Act, I led the efforts to include $10 billion in investments for our child nutrition programs. Now, we know that that passed the House and is pending over in the Senate, but we're working, uh, we're not giving up on getting these important programs passed. And I wanna note that um, part of my advocacy involved the Healthy Food Incentive Fund, 
to help schools improve scratch cooking capacity, exceed nutrition standards, and I'm very excited to see the Biden-Harris administration implementing a fund based on this proposal. Uh, I know that the federal government can play an important role in expanding access to fresh and healthy foods. I've always been a, a supporter of the Farm to School program, for example. Recently, I had the opportunity uh, over on the North Coast in Astoria to visit the Astoria Co-op. So they're participating in the SNAP um, Double Up Bucks program to help uh, SNAP recipients better access fruits and vegetables, uh, which is helpful. We've been able to get support to continue, as I mentioned, the child nutrition waivers, and we're continuing to respond also to the crisis in infant formula production address rising costs in that area through WIC, giving um, uh, flexibility there. Uh, but also working on the supply chain issues. So I remain committed to finding real solutions to help Oregonians and Americans keep food on the table and to address these overlapping challenges that affect um, food access in our region. We know about food deserts and we know there are food deserts in some areas. And if you look at the history of redlining, for example, showing we need a, a holistic approach to addressing housing insecurity along with our work to end hunger. I've had conversations with many of you around the table today about the need for a comprehensive approach to enact effective and equitable policies that examine the root causes of hunger and undernutrition and how they affect health and the prevalence of chronic disease and how they can be addressed. So I appreciate the opportunity to be together again, albeit virtually, uh, to, to discuss um, the actions that we need to take to end hunger and to increase healthy eating and physical activity. I look forward to hearing from you and I'm gonna open it up to discussion. I'm gonna put a couple of issues out there and just, re just really open it up and wanna hear from you. Um, when you're speaking, we didn't take time today to do introductions because I wanna have a lot of time for conversation. So when, when you're speaking, please say your name, but also your organization. And then also I, wa I wanted to let people know at the outset that um, if you have additional ideas, thoughts, inspiration um, afterward, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will be preparing a, a report for the administration. They've asked us to do outreach and to get ideas from our communities. And I know here in Northwest Oregon, we have so many advocates with so many great ideas. So I'm just going to put a couple of issues out there. You know, what specific actions should the federal government uh, both Congress and the executive branch be taking to end hunger, improve nutrition, and eliminate disparities? How has your community been affected by hunger or diet-related disease? What existing federal programs are effective? And what could be expanded or improved? What fed This is important too. What federal or, or state programs are not working or pieces of programs that aren't working? We really appreciate knowing that as well. And are there barriers that can be removed by the federal government that would help ease your work on hunger and nutrition? And I know we, we do work with our state and local partners as well, but we really wanna know uh, what we can do at the federal level and what actions should local, state and tribal governments, nonprofit and community groups take to achieve uh, our, our goals? And are there more opportunities for public-private partnerships? So uh, are, there, are there innovative things that you're doing uh, here in Oregon that could inform our actions at the federal level? Oftentimes, states and, and local um, work at the state level and local level is a sort of incubator and pilot of ideas that we can, can scale up uh, on the federal level. We want to hear about those too. And then finally, the you know, the dietary guidelines for Americans were last updated in 2020. So how can we improve nutrition education, especially for, for children, for students in our communities? So lots of issues to talk about today. I'm going to open it up. Uh, you can either raise your hand on the, with the Zoom feature, or you can just wave. Um, please make sure that your name is in the, uh, in your, uh, that you have your name. And, and when you speak, please, um, to have your name identified and then also have your um, state your organization. So who would like to start? I could be like the teacher and call on somebody. I saw Susanna Morgan from the Oregon Food Bank. <laughs> Good morning, Congresswoman. Um, uh, yeah, of course I have stuff to say. So I'll get um, my stuff out of the way so we can hear from folks more on the ground. I'm Susanna Morgan. I'm the CEO at Oregon Food Bank. 
and it's an honor to be here with you, Congresswoman, and with so many other great organizations. Um, as you know, at Oregon Food Bank, we our mission is to eliminate hunger and its root causes, and we work to ensure our community has the food we need today, and we work to change the systems and policies that create and perpetuate hunger. Um, as you probably know, hunger has been at its highest level ever since the pandemic in 2019, the number of people who sought food assistance through the 21 regional food banks and 1400 partners of the Oregon Food Bank Network was 860,000. In 2020, that number was 1.7 million. In 2021, that number was 1.2 million. As of right now, we think we are going back up. So we are back in, um, uh, in uh, the worst level of hunger that this country has seen since the 1930s. And we at Oregon Food Bank don't believe that hunger is primarily a result of per personal choices. It's a result of community-wide, it's a symptom of community-wide systems that perpetuate poverty and injustice. And that poverty itself as a root cause, that's racial, gender, and economic inequities. So um, we got a big job. I would love to share with you today um, some guidance we received specifically from folks who have lived experience of hunger. We have been working very closely with people um, accessing food from the food assistance system all across Oregon and Southwest Washington. And um, we have particular recommendations for the safety nets that I'd like to lift for you today. For SNAP, we recommend removing time limits, ending exclusions for immigrants and for college students, increasing benefit levels for older adults and establishing parity for our neighbors in Puerto Rico, American Sinaloa, CNMI, modernizing SNAP to reflect the true cost of healthy food and expanding the double up food box, which you mentioned you had seen in action in Astoria recently. For child nutrition programs, we recommend enacting the healthy school meals for all, which I know you support, making summer EBT available nationwide, making the recent improvements to summer meal programs permanent and making changes to the WIC program by increasing benefit levels for fruits and vegetables, extending nutrition benefits for moms and postpartums to two years and extending WIC eligibility for kids through the age of six. These Many of these ideas are not new and I know you've heard them before Congresswoman, but maybe we have an opportunity right now to make um, some of these things uh, true. It's also true that we need to remove barriers, that all of these benefits should be um, available when you apply for one. So <laughs> that if you need um, SNAP and WIC, you don't have to go to two different places to get it. And they should be available in multiple languages so that all of our neighbors can access them, whatever language it is they speak at home. And in the worst of times, the emergency food system where we hand out food is the very last resort. Um, um, uh, below um, living wage jobs, below the safety nets is the food assistance system. And we rely on food through the emergency food assistance program. There's an ask right now um, for a billion dollars of additional food to help us get through this year um, on the table, um, uh, adjusting CFR 251 um, so that states are prohibited from increasing barriers to service and that other states um, operate as well as Oregon does. Um, uh, and then I would also love to just be able to say again that we don't believe that hunger is a result of personal choices. It is a result of these big systemic barriers and um, those systemic barriers include uh, racism and sexism and disproportionately impact our black, indigenous and other people of color um, and prevent them from obtaining economic food security. Um, so here are a couple policy recommendations that directly address those root causes. Uh, and the first one I believe you totally agree with me on is let's 
bring back the monthly child tax credit. It worked. It worked so well. Um, <laughs> there's such good evidence uh, that um, it drove down child poverty by an incredible 41% and reduced food insecurity by 26%. If we do one thing, can we do that, please? Um, and then let's make housing affordable and accessible. Consistently, people requesting food cite housing as the biggest reason they're standing in line at a food pantry. Making childcare affordable and accessible to everyone. Make the earned income tax credit available to all workers and increase eligibility for people without kids. And end policies that result in mass incarceration. We have data that shows that a staggering 91% of people who return to our communities from incarceration experience food insecurity. So that's my big brain dump, Congresswoman. We're so glad to be here. Um, and I'm going to make time and space for my other colleagues. Susanna, thank you so much. I think you saw a lot of nodding heads throughout uh, agreeing with uh, so many of your ideas. And thank you for the work that you're doing, the Oregon Food Bank is doing, and for identifying uh, those pieces of policy. Absolutely, great. the child tax credit, what a difference that made. Uh, but all of your ideas we're going to take back. And many of those, as you know, are, are things that, that I'm working on. Uh, I'm going to go to who would like to speak next. I'd love to hear from everybody. Whitney. Good morning. You. Um, it's great to see you again. And thank you again for your visit to our schools. Um, I, I can per, pretty much say ditto to what Susanna said. Great, uh, great point, Susanna. And I figured I would Piggyback, since you uh, talked about child nutrition programs, I am the Senior Director of Nutrition Services at Portland Public Schools. Um, and yes, we've made, uh, I appreciate the support uh, through the Keep Kids Fed Act, and um, we're anxiously awaiting for the state to provide guidance on that. Um, Immediately, it will help our summer programs um, with some of the difficult conversations we're having with families about not having that grab and go option um, to take food off site. I just took a civil rights complaint uh, for a family who has a student with special needs where eating in the park is not an appropriate setting for their student. They tried and that was not the right environment for their student and or their child. And so um, the, the roadblocks that they face, they already have filed so much paperwork. Um, for their students' disability um, within the school system. And this is for a family that borders between Portland and David Douglas. And so while David Douglas might have the paperwork to understand this child's needs, um, my district does not. And so we're working to try and share that information. But what a, what a huge benefit to families um, to not have to navigate those things and to file complaints and to feel welcome in, a, in any setting um, to try and access the programs and services that we offer if we can eliminate some of that paperwork and burden on them. Um, similarly, again, um, having all meals for free within the school day. Um, I know you and I've talked about how, you know, we don't charge uh, a family for library books, right? Even if they can afford it, we don't charge them for library books within the schools. We don't charge them for certain things, but we do charge them for food based on their socioeconomics. And why are we adding that, that layer to the cafeteria that then places shame or stigma on our students as they are in the school day? Um, so we continue to advocate for that, for all meals to be free. If they want to eat with us, we want to be able to feed them. And that was the unfortunate thing as we started our summer program is with um, the pre-pandemic rules of the summer feeding program, um, I literally was having to tell um, schools and children that wanted or needed my services that their site was not eligible and therefore I could not provide them with food. And that's our purpose. That's why we're here. We're here to feed the kids that, that need it or want it. Um, and unfortunately, because of those old school rules, um, I had to tell them no or that they had to find other money to pay for my services. And that shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't have to pull from education dollars or other sources of funds. Um, and so I appreciate what we're doing now, but it was very uh, heartbreaking to um, have to say no in the beginning of setting up this program. So again, like Susanna said, to permanently place these things in place or streamline programs within the school district sponsors where we can just feed breakfast, lunch, and after school supper programs um, without having to reapply or navigate multiple programs um, during the school year or the summer would be um, 
a, a real benefit to our program, not just for families and students, but for my department operationally, it creates efficiencies and allows us to put more of that money towards the food on the plate and the people who are making those food, that food. And that's really at the core of what we do. Um, similarly with the SNAP, we are all interrelated and connected. So um, if we continue with the eligibility piece, um, our SNAP, um, uh, program really the economic piece of it, uh, the federal income guidelines um, does not match uh, what, what our families are experiencing, especially within Multnomah County. The cost of living is incredibly high um, and minimum wage is the higher than federal minimum wage. And so the, the point at which people are eligible for free or reduced price meals um, doesn't reflect what they're feeling in their own household. Um, so that is, is a disconnect, I know, not only for within Portland, um, but other um, major urban cities as well across the country. Um, so I um, would hope to see that happen. Um, I think one of the creative uh, options that we have here in Multnomah County is the support and connection between um, our after school um, partners in um, Sun and the connection between our food pantries, backpack programs and um, school markets. I think um, being able to expand or put more funds towards those opportunities helps to connect an, um, a place for families to access food for the entire family um, that my program um, is limited to just children. So while those families are able to visit schools and access those programs, they're able to increase their access to um, healthy foods for their entire family. Um, it makes it very convenient. And with the um, rising costs in transportation funds, the more that we can help um, those families access um, uh, food where they're already going um, will help to um, uh, better support them. And I know that that's come up in the last couple of years where we've been limited on the available funds, where some schools have asked for more frequent food markets or um, food pantries, but because of the cost of operating that, uh, we've been limited to uh, a limited number of times in a week or a month um, that we have it available in a certain area. And I know North Portland in particular has had a high need um, and has been very vocal um, amongst my principals about trying to improve that, that opportunity. Um, so I'll stop with that. And again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Whitney, for all of your excellent ideas. And I <clears throat> just want to emphasize the importance of number one, reducing or eliminating the, the bureaucratic paperwork, but also ending the stigma. Uh, I, some of the lunch shaming stories that I've heard are just heartbreaking and there's no reason for that to happen. Um, so, so thank you for all of your ideas. And thank, I think I saw Fatima with the Partners for Hunger Free Oregon next. Hi, yes. Hello everyone, I'm Fatma Jawad Marty. I use she, her pronouns and I'm from Hunger Free Oregon um, and really appreciate being here today and the opportunity that you're providing to hear from everyone in the Oregon community. It's just so valuable and I appreciate that. And I also just wanted a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about, I know that you Congresswomen have been a huge supporter of and proponent of and been leading the charge um, for a long time. Um, so I don't have too many additional things from what Susanna and Whitney have already shared, but just a couple pieces that I wanted to highlight more. Um, regarding child nutrition programs, we're really excited to see the Kids Fed Act pass, but know that the expansions and the things that are needed in our schools and our communities are far beyond that. In 2019, um, Oregon did pass, as I'm sure you know, a series of school meal expansions that really um, will support we're going suited to support our families in the ways that they needed. But as the pandemic happened and the federal supports and the federal waivers, they have been far beyond what the state had originally planned. And so I think being in a situation in the fall where we can roll back on those organ supports, but know they are nowhere near what's currently needed. I think just continuing to champion expansions to schools, meals, making sure that meals are flexible. And the additional things that I'll also say, so I know Susanna mentioned um, summer EBT and pandemic EBT. Oregon has been a pilot state of summer EBT for a long time. We have a lot of data around the impact and value that that has on our families during the summer because there's always been a gap once the school year ends and then families are 
you know, expected to meet two additional meals a day. And, you know, we hear a lot of hard choices that happen due to that, you know, parents having to make difficult decisions to put their kids first. And additionally, with pandemic EBT, just having schools have flexibilities, you know, the pandemic in the last couple of years have shown us what it looks like to be responsive in an emergency. But in Oregon, we've long had things that have impacted our schools and being able to have federal flexibility, such as fires or snow closures or things like that to make sure that kids are getting meals in those times. And then additionally, outside of um, school meals and child nutrition programs, also wanted to highlight, you know, just what I've been hearing a lot around hunger has long existed, but the pandemic has really exacerbated it. And like specifically for our most marginalized communities. And so a lot of the programs are not meeting the needs of our immigrant, refugee, and Gofa community members. They're not meeting the needs of our tribal reservations, and they're not meeting the needs for our college students and older adults. So really looking at both program access, because many of these groups don't have eligibility, and then also in kind of, I've heard a lot about streamlining the process, making applications more accessible, specifically looking at language access and how things are communicated, things that the, our federal government that can provide that help folks with the fear and the stigma and just the not knowing how to access programs. Susanna highlighted what it would feel like to show up to one place and be able to access all of the resources that families need to thrive. Um, and additionally, <clears throat> I think, actually, I'm looking through my notes here. I think that is a lot of what I would really highlight is just so many of our communities are not having their needs met, and they have not had their needs met for a long time, and we're really seeing those disproportionate impacts increase over the pandemic. So I'll pause there to create space for other folks. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for, for all you've done and your ad ongoing advocacy and for highlighting, yes, there are so many disparities and gaps that uh, we want to work on closing. So thank, thanks for being with us. Who would like to go next? Not uh, Nayeli. I hope I said your name properly. Yeah. Oh, hi. I'm Nayeli. I um, currently am working in the Basic Needs Hub at Portland State University uh, as an assistant, but I also have worked um, for the Portland State Food Pantry. Um, I have also uh, worked with and known many students from all backgrounds. And I myself growing up, um, my family um, had EBT and we utilize food pantries. So I am also like a person with like the lived experience. Um, I love everything that everybody has said so far. Um, I have maybe more of a slightly pivot of one of, one of my ideas. Um, so for my capstone, um, I think a year ago, I was able to uh, work with Roberta Eagle Horse um, on, uh, with her uh, women's wellness garden, which I think is on or was on the Oregon Food Bank um, like garden area of property. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but um, I think when it comes to like food and health, I think a big part of it is also like connection to the earth and connection to the food. And I think um, something in addition to all of these wonderful things that have already been talked about is focusing on uh, garden, um, education, gardening education, uh, community gardens, uh, maybe like one idea I, you know, I don't know all the specifics about how things can be done, but, uh, especially in areas where it's mostly apartments and people don't have land, um, to grow anything or have to rely on pots or raise beds and stuff. Um, <laughs> having maybe like government funded um, people who can help create gardens and sustain gardens for different communities and uh, training for everybody. Like, how can you grow food at home? How can you grow food? And if you only have a tiny amount of space, uh, how can you grow food with other people? Um, I think that would just help a lot <laughs> um not only for like especially if people need culturally specific foods um 
but also to just have that connection because that's a, an issue that we have that we don't have that connection to food anymore. Um, and we also don't have the opportunity or are able to because of how our systems have been built where we are working so much that we can't even like do what we as humans like should be should be able to enjoy which is having that connection to food um the other thing that i um more specifically have in my mind as a, a student who um knows other students is that i know that, that has to do with destigmatization um a lot of students do not feel comfortable signing up for SNAP or going to the pantry, um, especially if, and I know a lot of students who maybe they grew up like more middle class and, but now they are struggling. And because they never um, had to worry before, they don't know what resources are available to them. And if they do um, find information, they don't feel comfortable taking it because they feel that they don't deserve it or, um, other people should be taking it over them, which is not the case at all. If you are struggling or if you are eligible, then you should be able to uh, use those resources. Um, so uh, I, I think I, I don't really know exactly how to go about the, um, furthering like destigmatization, but I think that is also um, very important. And um, yeah, that's thank you. What, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Nayeli. I really enjoyed my visit recently to Portland State to, to meet with students, to talk about food insecurity, to visit the food pantry. And I am working on legislation to expand opportunities for students um, to learn more about what is available currently. Um, through SNAP and other programs. So thank you for sharing your lived experience. I was in the same situation. I was on my own when I went to college. Um, and I and I used food stamps as well, then food stamps, SNAP benefits as well to help me because otherwise I wouldn't have had enough food to eat. So it, you know, it's having that lived experience that you know you really appreciate and bring that to the table. So thank you for sharing um, your ideas and also emphasizing the importance of growing food and connecting with that. And that's why I'm such a supporter of school gardens and farm to, to, farm to school programs. And I have seen um, students actually eat food because they grew it themselves that they would probably not have ventured to taste um, otherwise. So it, it is really, you've made some very important points and I appreciate that. Um, I see Tyler and then Ashley. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Tyler Johnson. I work uh, at the Community Action Program of East Central Oregon, where I oversee all of our food pantries and energy and weatherization programs. Um, I just uh, wanted to echo everybody's topics that they've discussed so far and also um, throw out some others. Uh, uh, out here, rural access to foods is um, a really a big thing. Uh, you mentioned um, food deserts, and that is a hard thing to uh, break down. Um, one uh, one way to go about it that we haven't instituted out here, but I have seen it in other areas, are is the healthy corner store. So just a small little uh, mom and pop shop uh, in just like a little bodega or something in the middle of a small town that has access to fresh fruits and vegetables, um, nutritious uh, meats and stuff like that. Um, I also think another thing would be, I, I come from a public health standpoint and I have dealt with a lot of policy and medical research and um, demystifying some of the terminology around nutrition that um, we use frequently, but you take it to even some of the well-educated people that don't uh, play around in these arenas, and they may not understand what food security means in the same way that we are using it. So demystify some of those terminologies, define them outright, what, uh, what we're meaning when we're talking about um, food insecurity, food deserts, stuff like that. Um, and also just um, 
nutrition education in general has slipped from our school systems and it's not a fault of the school systems. Uh, my parents and my sister, my parents were lifelong teachers. My sister is a current teacher. Um, there's not enough time, not enough uh, money in the budget to support nutrition education. Getting nutrition education back in the schools, including um, cooking education, not in the same way home ec was done, but something similar to home ec that uh, shows people at a young age how to prepare healthy meals, how to read labels so that they will know what they're getting. Um, and then also working on uh, creating a different grocery store environment. Uh, here I'm in Hermiston today and we have a local grocery store that the owner um, came from the Portland metro area and he designed the grocery store to have all of the healthier food in one aisle so it's not mixed in with all the other canned goods. You don't go down the canned vegetable aisle and search for the healthy canned peas or canned corn you can find them in a particular aisle. So the you don't get lost in searching the grocery store for the healthy item. Um, the other thing too is um, a con more of a connection, break down the barrier between the medical system and the non-medical system around nutrition. Uh, I mean, you have registered dietitians in the medical system. You have the intermediary, which is kind of the nutrition therapist uh, that's kind of in between the two. And then you have the health educator and then the average public. Um, so find a way to kind of break down that nutrition education component. Uh, and then finally, um, people have already spoken about destigmatization. Um, destigmatize the system for nutrition aid, uh, the SNAP, um, that type of stuff. Also destigmatize some of the um, some of the long-held beliefs uh, around food, at, whether it be ethnic or uh, connected to, to disease. So, like um, I know in certain places, being a vegetarian or a vegan may be frowned upon. But explain, uh, have some conversations happened about why that may be a better health choice for somebody with different issues. Um, and also how the family history or the genetics plays into nutritional diseases. Um, I'll, I'll let somebody else talk, but thank you again for joining us. Tyler, thank you so much. So many great ideas. And thank you for bringing the rural perspective. It's a reminder that hunger is an issue everywhere in the state in the country it's not just an urban area not in, in areas not just in suburban areas it's everywhere um, and i really i love the healthy corner store um, idea so so thank you and uh, as a as a member of the education committee education ashley from the oregon farmers market association welcome Thank you, Ashley Hess. I'm the executive director at OFMA, Oregon Farmers Market Association. She, her, thanks for having us. Um, I have a lot of things. The first thing specifically would be um, changes to GusNet policy, allowing for double up food buck ma matches um, for meat and dairy. That's something our shoppers have been asking for for a long time. The program is fantastic and it works really well at farmers markets. And the next thing would be fixing housing policy. Um, or you can make the food cheaper, but when someone's spending 80 to 90% of their income on their rent, that's not going to help. Um, we need to really fix housing policy, particularly here in Oregon. And I think there's a lot of tax revisions that can be done, including limiting depreciation for vacant units. I think in Portland, there's over 16,000 vacant units while we have um, record houselessness. Um, I think that investments in infrastructure are huge. Our processing facilities are so limited. Farmers have to go so far. That creates food deserts because rural areas are not able to bring in food. Um, railways, electric vehicles, the cost of diesel right now when the bulk of our food is reliant on that type of transportation is really hitting our farmers hard. They're absorbing those costs. Um, Infrastructure, particularly in Oregon and co-packing facilities, 
and cold storage and food hubs. We do not have a lot and federal funding can help support that, particularly in meat packing and cold storage for our farmers here. Um, infrastructure and farmers markets. In food deserts, there are a lot of farmers markets, but they're very limited and small and federal funding to support those has been helpful um, to bring fresh food, local food, healthy food into communities that may have limited access because they're a food desert or far out there. Um, food waste is huge. A lot of our food goes to waste. I used to work in the food waste industry and it was bananas how much perfectly good food was thrown away right at the source. And there are a lot of federal tax revisions that can, can help enhance that, including um, an incentive that would be more like a tax credit for what we would call like a low margin business, such as farms. Farms throw away a lot of food because it's not marketable or it costs them more to get it to the customer. And if there were in, uh, a tax credit and some revisions to the policies, um, it would be really valuable for our farmers particularly and our producers, as well as making food much more affordable. I've seen a lot of grocery stores that mark their, their blemished food down during the days. And I think being able to have a tax credit for that for larger chains would be fantastic as well. They throw away a lot of perfectly good food. Um, and so giving them tax credits and possibly even um, increasing the uh, access to compost and requiring them to compost food or donate it rather than sending it to the landfills where it's be creating a climate crisis. Um, and of course, I think, you know, echoing everything that everyone said, but adjusting the federal poverty limit, it's not realistic. Um, and you know, it should be more in line with what a living wage is and, and to go in line with, um, not exactly with inflation. I know that that would be a logistic nightmare, but it is, um, that's not the real poverty limit and it needs to be adjusted and reflect what's actually happening in America. Um, and I think that is all with all of my notes. Lots of, lots so of- So many great ideas, Ashley. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that, per the perspective of the farmers and identifying the, the issue of food waste. So, such great ideas. Thank you for joining us. Next, I have Francia from Adelante Mujeres and then Carla from Adelante Mujeres. And after that, we'll have Kaylee. Hello, good morning. I'm Francia Yera from Adelante Mujeres and I am the Child Nutrition Coordinator and I run the Child Nutrition Program. Uh, one of the things that we focus on Adelante Mujeres is about teaching the, the kids at this very young age about food, where the food comes from, how to grow it, as what we use in the garden, um, because we want to create a new generation uh, where they have more knowledge about where the food comes from and the healthy choices they can make. But one of the things that everybody here is mentioning is like, what happens after school? Who teaches the regular population about nutrition? So I think it will be very good to have uh, nutrition or dietitians available um, at your workplace as well, because I personally just consulted one when I was pregnant and I became with gestational diabetes. But before that, me being completely healthy, never crossed my mind to go visit one and maybe have some options for me to never have that experience of gestational diabetes. Um, I feel like what Nayeli mentioned about having people more connected to, to where their food sources come from, like having community gardens, it would be really good to have people go back to growing their own food. Um, and just like we have lost that all buildings in, in apartment complex have to have a fire alarm or fire detector, a smoke detector, we should be able to have a law that asks the apartment complex to have a community garden. Um, and that will be really helpful if it is required by law to have that. We're not going to force people to go for it, but at least have it available and have the resources and the information. It's like, oh, you're going to come in and be my, <clears throat> rent my apartment. We have a community garden. Would you like to know more about it? And from there, have the resources to move on if anybody needs to go to like apply for food stamps or, or week or find a dietitian or things like that. Thank you so much, Francia, yeah. for your, your work at Adelante Mujeres and, and also for sharing your personal story. Uh, yes, it's so important to have those community gardens. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next, Carla, also from Adelante Mujeres, welcome. 
Uh, thank you so much for inviting us. And yes, I am the health equity manager at Adelante Mujeres, and I'm having so much trouble with the internet today, so my notes are just not showing up. But I agree with everything everyone has said today, and it's so nice to hear all these new ideas. I am very new to Oregon, so I am definitely an outsider looking in, which I think gives an important opinion, opinion because because I can see things that maybe other people haven't seen. And so the disconnect that Francia was talking about is, is serious. There's, there's just, people don't know where the things come from and food, we're specifically talking about food, but we don't know where half the things we have on a daily basis come from. So it's so important to get information out there, like how things are grown, where they're grown, what are the uh, benefits of these different vegetables and fruits that we have grown locally and not always buying things uh, just from the supermarket that are uh, imported from other countries. So that was just one thing. But I did think um, one thing that is also super important to talk about is how badly we need funding. <laughs> if everyone here has so many amazing ideas. And at Adelante Mujeres, we have ideas after ideas, but we always get stuck when it comes to the money. We're like, yeah, we want to do this. And we have this idea to get out to the community, this and, and this other idea, but we don't have the money to, to do all these things. And I think that we could really do a lot more if we have just a little bit more funding. And something that Francia and I actually talked about right before, before this, um, this round table was we see marketing all day long. Social media is all over the place. It's like really has control, kind of at sometimes controls our lives. And it is so, it would be amazing if we had some sort of marketing or marketing culture, advertising that focuses on not just pack, like not packaged food, sodas, going to McDonald's and Taco Bell, but like, hey, the local farmers, the, um, the, the local gardens, all the things that like that I was just talking about, fr fruits and vegetables, like why we have nothing that focuses on that to get people's attention uh, in, in, a, in a more like a internet type way and social media way. And then one more thing I wanted to, to say was that when I don't remember your name, I think you're, uh, I'm not sure, but it, when you were talking about farmers, it just like an idea just jumped out at me. It, it would be so amazing if, it, if the farmers, because they're the ones that come to the farmer's markets, they sometimes have that connection with a local a local supermarket and they can they can sell their fruits and vegetables there but what if what if the government allowed them like a small little store within their farm where the people can actually go and purchase their things directly from the farmer and that way they make ends meet as you know and they can make a little bit of profit off of this amazing organic locally grown food. and then come back to Carla to finish up when she reconnects Carla we lost you for a minute there Okay, let's go to let's go to Kaylee, and then we'll come back to Carla, and then I don't know. I saw Matt Nilching uh, applaud. Uh, I don't know, Matt, if you want to join us after um, Kaylee and Carla. Hi there, my name is Kaylee Summers. Um, I am the food security program manager at OHSU. I also um, am a board member of the uh, Oregon Farmers Market Association and chair a veggie prescription um, working group through the Oregon Community Food Systems Network. Um, and I just want to applaud all of my colleagues here on the call today. I won't um, mention all of the amazing programming and ideas that you already said, but I just want to say ditto as well. Um, and I, the one program that I did want to um, rise up and, and highlight um, is um, it, veggie prescription or produce prescription programs as a model um, that has taken off in Oregon. Um, and we have in Oregon been a, um, a role model for other states and programs that are um, starting up across the nation um, in terms of veggie prescription or produce prescription programs. And I think as we've all talked about today, these it, hunger doesn't happen alone, right? There are all of transportation and housing and um, incarceration, all of these issues that, um, that make life so difficult for um, folks living in the United States is, um, across the nation. We really do need to think about 
intersectional partnerships for these complex issues. And that not just one program is going to fix everything. We need to be thinking um, about child nutrition programs, about community gardens, about supporting farmers, about um, reforming the federal um, poverty level, all of these things. Um, but to mention this, this program um, model of veggie prescription programs where public and private partnerships really create um, this huge benefit, not only to patients, but um, talking about supporting small farmers and economic development, both in rural, urban, and suburban areas to address hunger, nutrition, and health for Oregonians and other folks in other um, states as well. And so I would really, um, I'd be happy to talk to you um, or send your staffers more information about these types of programs after this meeting too. Um, but I think um, as Carla mentioned as well, um, greater utilization, but also financial um, support for these types of programs, um, not only in Oregon, but nationwide, and using Oregon as um, a model that standardizing coding and how flexible funding dollars are being used um, to support these types of programs um, so that this is not only another safety net for folks um, on, you know, who are falling between the gaps. I, I just want to point out too, um, I, I had worked with my colleagues at um, Francia and Carla at Adelante Mujeres for over 10 years. And one, and we had a, a VEGRX program that is continuing to thrive. And one of the reasons why we started that program is because um, of that stigma of signing up for SNAP or being un ineligible for SNAP benefits because of immigration status. And that through these partnerships with local healthcare partners, we could identify families who really did need those food supports, would get those um, uh, benefits to shop at a farmer's market and get groceries for a week at a time um, throughout the, that growing season. Um, so that really supported families. Um, and um, and caught some folks that would have fallen through the gaps otherwise. Um, and I think in, in Oregon, we are situated where um, we have the coverall kids program. So folks on OHP um, can get support through these VeggieRx programs and get paid through that those benefits are paid for through CCOs, um, but we need to standardize that and make that um, more known across the board there and then nationwide as well. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity on this. And I um, uh, I just want to applaud um, everyone who's who's doing this work. The, the work that I'm doing at OHSU too is really supporting employees. And I, um, just because someone has an OHSU badge on doesn't mean that they're not struggling with food insecurity um, and that uh, you know that something uh, other colleagues here have mentioned that stigma of reaching out for support um, even if you have a full-time job or multiple jobs life is difficult and it's not it's not working right now for many many people um, so thank you so much thank you thank you Kaylee and thank you for reminding us about the intersectionality of all these things and I have had a couple of visits this week uh, dealing with the need for more affordable housing for example and can you just confirm Kaylee is the is the veggie prescription program just exactly as it sounds prescribing uh, for for I assume children to get vegetables or for adults as well Children and adults. So typically, the way that it works is that it's a partnership between a healthcare clinic or FQHC and a community benefit organization where patients are identified by the clinic. And then the community organization um, connects those patients with food resources, usually at a farmer's market or a CSA. Um, they receive those, those food benefits um, throughout the growing season or sometimes year round. Sometimes that food is delivered directly to the family or sometimes the family goes and shops at a farmer's market to receive that food. And it covers usually children or entire families depending on the program. Thank you so much. And I didn't know if Matt wanted to weigh in. Uh, we do have press and I want to give them a minute. Matt, did you want to, to add anything to the oh, conversation? No, no, I'm staffing Suzanne. I just dropped a note in the chat. Thank you for the invite though. And great to see everyone. Thank today. you. What great a great, what a great group. Thank you.
Um, so, so I know we have press on the line and this is a time where they can ask questions if you have any. Anybody, I have KATU and Fox 12, KPTV on at least. Anybody else, any, any press have any questions? Coin as well, maybe? Okay, I'm not, I'm not hearing any questions from the press. So we are almost at time, but I just wanted to, to thank everyone so much. It's been a, a very useful conversation and discussion. Uh, I, I thank you all for not only your ideas, but for all you're doing to uh, address the needs in our community. Uh, we are going to be sharing, we're going to put together, we um, mostly Al and Andrew and the team will be putting together uh, a report uh, summarizing the ideas, the stories that we heard today uh, to uh, get it back to the administration and the White House to inform their work as they're uh, preparing for the, the big conference in September. So uh, this is going to be very helpful. I mean, Oregon is often a place where we have creative ideas and, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, pilots and programs that are really making a difference. And I think we heard about all of those today. And again, if you have additional ideas or thoughts, um, please do not hesitate. I know uh, my staff has put information into the chat um, where you can contact them with uh, additional ideas, thoughts. Um, and just again, thank you everyone so much for joining us, for for all you're doing in the community and uh, please uh, stay in touch. I appreciate your engagement uh, and leadership on, on these critical issues. So thank you again to everyone and look forward to following up with all of you soon. Take care.